You know, Marge and I enjoy traveling. And this last year, uh, any traveling we have done has been of a professional nature. It's been of crisis management nature. But we do love taking vacations. And we've had the privilege of uh, visiting Monaco, I think, about four times. Now, who can tell me what country Monaco's in? It's its own country. Very good. People often think, well, because of the Comité de Beaujolais, they think because of the French, you know, that it must be France, and that's just not true. It's its own country. There was a woman who was um, a part of another kingdom, not Monaco, Hollywood. And she exchanged the kingdom of Hollywood for the queendom or the kingdom of Monaco, and that would be, of course, who? Princess Grace, her last name. And then she changed it to Mount Rainier, without the mount, of course. Anyway, how many of you know you never want to compare a woman to a mountain? They'll get very offended very quickly. And Grace Kelly, you might remember her in the movie with Bing Crosby, a high society and quite a history, a very elegant woman. Unfortunately, she uh, met her early demise through an automobile accident in Monaco a number of years ago. But imagine you at the, at the height of her career, at the height of her career, she was brought up in a very conservative Catholic family here in a very sheltered life. Here is this woman who meets a prince, and she becomes royalty, but she exchanges one kingdom for another. Now, if you're born again today, and I want you to just take a moment, and I am not here to threaten your salvation. I have found that the Word of God says we're to work this salvation thing out. It's not automatic. We're to work it out. And this is something that's lacking in our pulpits today. It's lacking in our Bible studies. It's been lacking in our nation for nearly 50 years. And, and it's this. It's working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The way many of us work out our salvation is we try to find a kingdom or we try to find a church, and a church is part of the kingdom. We are not the kingdom. We're part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is far more global, far more universal, uh, not to use the word universal uh, flippantly, if you will, but we often try to find a church that appeals to our spiritual appetite and our spiritual aptitude. And we figure if I go to a church where everything I do, you know, like gossiping, or it could be lying, or it could be pornography, it could be fornication, it could be being unkind to people, it could be being flippant with my wife or my husband, whatever, we often will search an environment where I feel I can still win. It's kind of like when I was a basketball player. You probably didn't know this, but in fifth grade, I was a basketball player for a moment, and I mean a moment. And then and the name of the basketball at the Jewish Community Center, because we Jews tend not to be very tall. Saul was an anomaly, head and shoulders above the rest. And when you're my size, it's not hard to have people that are five foot eight maybe and head and shoulders above the rest. That wasn't Saul. We had a, a program in the YMCA, this is really true, Biddy Basketball. And then they used to say Billy Biddy Basketball since I was playing and they called me Billy back then. And they lowered the hoop to five feet. Well, you know, when you're three feet, five feet is still a bit of a stretch. Well, eventually for our group, they brought it down to four feet versus 10 feet. Now that, I, I could almost win there. I didn't, and I didn't last there, but you know, but they, 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 they kind of change things. Often we look for a bitty church. We look for a church where we keep lowering the hoop and lowering the hoop, and man, I can slam dunk it. But we definitely, never, definitely never want to hear these words from Jesus on the other side of eternity. Get away from me, you doer of iniquity, because you never were my kingdom. I, 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 I never knew you. And that's why the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear, with reverence for God, and a little bit of trembling. This is the God of eternity. How many of you know when a guy can flung the stars into space, when he can set the planets in space, when he creates not just our galaxy, this is one of billions of galaxies, there's a sense of awe. When you sing, our God is an awesome God, it shouldn't just be a little ditty. It shouldn't just be a little Broadway, you know, uh, shuffle ball step. It really is. He is awesome. But he's also awesome in that, yes, he holds the whole world in his hand, but he holds my salvation in his hand as well. Fortunately, the Bible says when you're really born again, when you really exchange one kingdom for another, that you are in his hand and not one can pluck you out. Isn't that awesome? Not one can pluck you out. 
So we all left a kingdom of darkness when we entered the kingdom of God. In fact, the title of my message today is Enter. And I'm using that word because it's a beautiful Hebrew word and it's a beautiful Greek word and it's an invitation. It's one that actually tells me I gotta take a step. I've got to actually come to a place of connectivity. I have to speak a foreign language, not the language of Babel, but the language of Pentecost, a language of unity, a language of truth. You see, the language of Pentecost, when everybody was on the same page, was Peter confronting Jewish culture. He was talking to the church of the day there, and he was saying, Jesus, who you crucified, Jesus, who you crucified. Not everybody liked that message. When the Pharisees heard it, they wanted to kill him. And yet it was a message that was important to say, but here's the good news. He still forgave you. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The whole message of Pentecost is, which kingdom do you live in? Are you willing to switch kingdoms? Someone asked you a question today. What kingdom did you exchange when you entered the kingdom of God? No, 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 I want you to take a moment here now. Don't just blow this one off. What kingdom did you exchange when you entered the kingdom of God? I, and I, I exchanged a kingdom of selfishness. I exchanged a kingdom of pride. I exchanged a kingdom of false religion. Like Paul, I really thought I had it right as a Jew. I exchanged a kingdom of arrogance. I exchanged a self-serving kingdom of darkness for a kingdom of light. But why it's important to recognize the kingdom that you exchanged, Alvin, when you were in the Marines. It's important after 20 years you couldn't get out soon enough. When you say, what kingdom... Did I exchange? That's your default kingdom. We tend to go back to that kingdom if we do not die daily. You see, Terry, you came to know the Lord later. Patty, you guys came to know the Lord a little bit later on in life. Trisha, you were born saved, as they say. You know what I mean? You're brought, and sometimes you have to exchange the kingdom of Sunday school. Sometimes you have to exchange the kingdom of a certain security. You're brought up in a pastor's home, and I mean, come on, if you're brought up in Pastor Wolfson's home, then people used to ask you, what's it like to live with Pastor Wolfson? And Trisha would say, every time he breathes on me, I just sense the Spirit of God. She said something like that, but totally different, if you will, you know? You see, friends, this, our theme this year is what? The year of, wait, 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 only Adam gets to answer it, nobody help him. Adam, if you get this right, you get to run your family for a whole minute. The year? Wait, wait, wait. who helps you? Jacob gave you the answer, didn't he? Wake Jacob up for a minute. Wait, I'm teasing Jacob. I see you there. What is it? No, yell. No, he was wide awake. Yell it out. Yell, Adam, stand up. Stand on your chair. Hurry up, hurry up. Stand on your chair. You're too tall now. Okay, yeah, you got real balance. Don't go into water skiing. Yell the theme. No, no, you forgot to say the year of. Okay, can you sing it now? Okay, I got you to talk at least. Come on, give him a round of applause. <laughs> Do you know that scripture reduces all the kingdoms, all the kingdoms of heaven and earth into two categories? Did you know that? All of them into two. One is the kingdom of darkness. The other one's the kingdom of light. Now, here's the freaky deal. It says in the scripture, here is the condemnation. John said this. Light came into the world, but man preferred darkness because the light exposed their evil deeds. And I, I'll be upfront with you. 
There's times I prefer darkness. How many of you, the older you get, a couple wrinkles come in, you prefer darkness? How many of you know a little bit of acne, you prefer darkness? How many of you know there's times when your wife's confronting a sin in your life or an attitude in your life, and you don't necessarily want that light in that given moment? Or, you know, you're putting a little bit of weight on, and so you're asking somebody, you know, um, am I putting a little bit of weight on? You kind of prefer darkness. You're not always sure you want the light in that situation. See, if you are a believer... All believers are citizens of the kingdom of light. Rise and shine for your light. Your glory has come. I want you to look at this today. Our goal is to, and as Christians we're called to do this, to extend the kingdom of light, but we're into the kingdoms of darkness. We're called to extend the kingdom of darkness of light into the kingdoms of darkness. And I have a question. Enter. Enter. How are we doing in this area? How am I doing? See, Matthew 5, 13 already says we're the salt of the earth. You are. In fact, in verse 14, it builds on that theme and says, you are the light. But man prefers darkness to light, John says. But it says, you are the light. But you see, many people prefer darkness. The Pharisees were called children of darkness. These were the pastors of the day. You are the light of the world. And it says a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. It doesn't mean it can't be hidden, by the way. In Greek, it means it ought not be hidden. It's bad behavior. Because the very reason God keeps us on this planet and doesn't just bop us on the head and bring us home the day we got saved, because let's face it, that's a better plan. You never have to sin again. There's no temptation again. It's like, D Jesus, come to my heart and be my Lord and Savior. <laughs> oh, hey, Jesus, I'm with you now. That sounds easy. But he's kept us here, and he disciples us so that we might make disciples so that we can spread the light, so we can bring the light to the nation, so we can bring the light to the places of darkness. This is really important. The Apostle Paul, he actually spread the kingdom of darkness. And here's the, here's the, here's, here's the kicker. He did it, Kenny. He, he, I, you're not going to believe this. In the name of God and religion. In the name of God and religion. Can you imagine a pastor? Can you imagine an apostle? Can you imagine a leader? And this guy was of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, a Pharisee among Pharisees. This guy had it going. He had some chops, man. And a wealthy guy, he was a tent maker, which would have been a modern-day builder of those days. And he's going all the way up to Damascus, way out of Jerusalem. He's way beyond Rome, and he's a citizen of Rome. Here's a guy that's going out of his way to do what he believes with, his, with a whole heart. This is what he was supposed to do. But he kills Stephen the deacon, who was also an evangelist. He was coming against Jewish Christian believers. Can you imagine spreading the king of kingdom of darkness, thinking you're spreading the kingdom of light, but you're getting it all wrong, and you're doing it in the name of God. Oh, Lord, please bless my travels as I kill these Jewish Christians who are apostate. They're heretics. They're getting it all wrong. But then again, that's what the Dutch Reformed Church did. The Dutch Reformed Church, before they would go to Liberia, West Africa, before they go to Sierra Leone, before they would go to get what they called the savages of the globe, the blacks that are less than human and more than animals, and as they would go to Africa and rip them off the womb of their own culture and nation and bring them here into servitude and bondage, and close to two-thirds of them on many of the ships never made it here alive, and they would pray for traveling mercies. These were individuals who claimed to be born again. These are individuals who genuinely felt they were serving God, and yet amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. It's the story of one of these Dutch Reformed sailors, a captain who actually propagated slavery. It's interesting when the light goes on. So we knew the, the Apostle Paul was, was, he felt he was of God, but he wasn't of God, and he wasn't doing the will of God. Well, let's read, let's read his own words, Acts 9.1. Meanwhile, it's really Luke's words about Paul. Shaul, and by the way, people often say, 
Paul went from a Saul to a Paul. Not true. Shaul's his Hebrew name, and Paul is his Roman name, and he used both of them well after he got saved, uh, long after. Meanwhile, Shaul was still, this is key, continuously breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. He's a, a disciple. He's about to find out he's fighting God. He's kicking against the pricks, the Bible says. This guy here is self-sabotaging. So, uh, how many are promoting the kingdom of darkness even today under the banner of Christianity? I want you to think of this. That's what the Crusaders were doing. That's what the Spanish Inquisition was all about. Friends, that's what even the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, has done. Friends, I'm going to suggest today this is exactly what BLM actually has done. This is what liberation theology does. So often there are people and they really believe that they're right, even though they are completely out of alignment, incongruent with Scripture, they're still convinced that what is wrong is now right. And yet how often can we justify gossip? Lying, discontent. See, godliness with contentment is great gain. But Paul exchanged kingdoms when? When his world fell apart. When he was knocked off his high horse. When you're instantly blinded, regardless if it's the light of God or not, here's the condemnation. Light came into the world. He was blinded by the truth. He was blinded by the light. And all of a sudden his heart got eyeballs. His spirit got eyeballs. And he became born again. He could see the truth. But he was blind and he knew he was fighting God and in a moment's time he went on a 14 year pilgrimage of discipleship where he would then minister until the, re until the last day of his life and here's what we see well let's read about it it says here uh, Titus 1.1 1, 1, Paul a bond servant now he's a prisoner of God man he's tethered to God of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ who, who said he was an apostle who says he's a bondservant of God? According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth. Underline that. Underline that. And the acknowledgement of the truth. When you acknowledge the truth, a truth spoken in love. When you acknowledge the truth that Jesus is the truth, the way and the life. When you acknowledge the truth which accords with godliness. It changes your lifestyle. It changes who you are. Notice something here. I'm not asking anybody here to stop lying. I'm not asking anyone to stop fornicating. I'm not asking anyone to stop drinking. I'm not asking, no, 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 no. You see, friends, it says here with Paul, he could have tried to do all these things, but he was self-deceived. He was blinded by the enemy. And he kept doing it in the name of God. And he kept doing it while walking in darkness, thinking he's in light. No, what happens is when you have a faith and an acknowledgement of the truth, you will come in accord with godliness. Isn't that wonderful, man, with godliness? But it gets so much better. Then what happened? Where Paul was extending an atmosphere of hate, anger, murderous threats, and murder, all of a sudden, he would extend the light in Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Thessalonica, all the way to Rome. And he went to the very seat of darkness, far beyond where we're at today, where Nero for 15 years was murdering Christian after Christian after Christian after Christian after Christian. After Christian. And Paul would bring the light. They would put him in prison, squadrons of other guards that would be chained to him. And he'd lead him to the Lord. And we are told historically they had to keep changing the prison guards because he kept leading him to the Lord. We see this even in Ephesus where the, uh, the, the Philippi, rather, where the Philippian jailer was ready to kill himself because he thought Paul had escaped. He knew he would be be brutally murdered for what he did, executed, if you will. And yet he said, no, no, do yourself no harm. It's all good. It's all good. And he led him to the Lord too. Today I want to discuss, can you believe that's just an introduction? That's just an introduction. Today I want to discuss 
This is good news now. This is good news, how simple it is to become a citizen of God's kingdom. Simple. My wife is a Canadian. She's about to become an American. She went all the way to Riverside the other day, ready for the test, and she studied and said, oh, we forgot to send you this one paper. Go home, we'll send you another sheet. It's not easy. We've been married for 42 years, and she still isn't a citizen. <laughs> but, you know, she lives here, and she's, she ain't going anywhere. She's a great woman. Uh, guys, it was very difficult to even get her into this country when we got married 42 years ago. Another story. This is simple, though. Can you imagine it's more difficult to get into America than it is to get into heaven? I think. I'll let you judge. So here's our big idea today. Becoming a citizen of God's kingdom is what? Effortless. All that Marge and I had to do to get her into America when we got married, the pastor, and I'm all, I've almost forgiven him. No, I've forgiven him. He sent the marriage certificate certificate in that says we're married instead of the marriage license that says the ceremony was done and so when it was time to bring my bride into the country they wouldn't let us in i had to get on a seaplane in vancouver to go to vancouver island to vital statistics you don't want to hear it but back in 1979 where we didn't have a whole bunch of money i'm putting out hundreds of dollars in one day just to get a temporary visa because her permanent alien visas, you know, Mars is from Mars or Venus, she's an alien, uh, to get her in here was next to impossible. But this is different, if you will. You see, friends, becoming an American is complicated. Becoming a citizen of heaven is not. Becoming a citizen of God's kingdom is what? Effortless. Religion is often made entering the kingdom of God nearly impossible. I want you to think of it. I'm going to blow a few of your minds today. See, some of us make a glass of wine the issue as to whether you can enter the kingdom of heaven and shame on us. You better hear me. If you have battled with alcohol, how many of you have ever had a battle with alcohol? Just tell the truth, shame the devil. You ever had a battle? Ever had a battle? Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Now, am I telling you to go out and do it? No. No, that's not my point today. But I'm here to tell you, and this is vital you hear it, maybe you have a struggle with food. Do we all stay away from food? I'm not saying that either. We've often made a person think, you can't swear, you can't lie, you can't fornicate, you can't commit adultery. Those are great byproducts of coming into the light, of knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. But the Mormons have figured out how not to drink. They've even done this one better with coffee. The Mormons have already figured out, and the Jehovah Witnesses have figured out how bad fornication is and the swearing, and that's not the point of this message today. I want you to hear me very carefully, because if you leave here saying that pastor some or other said we should all become drunks, you missed it. Pastor said fornicating's okay, didn't say it. I'm saying if you're truly born again, your appetites will change. If you're truly born again, your desires will change. If you're truly born again, well, let's let God speak for himself. Luke 11 verse 46 shows how difficult religion. What does religion mean again? Anyone remember? Uh, well, I'm, you know, Amy, this is the first time Denise beat you. This is a competition. But this is great now. No, she's beat you up sure before, but I just didn't hear it. Listen, listen to Jesus talking to what have been the religious leaders of his day. Luke 11, and these are the guys Jesus actually agreed with. He said, do what the Pharisees say, just don't do what they do. <laughs> do what they say. He said, they got great doctrine, great theology, but they're, they're, they're skunks though too in what they do. And here's why. Luke 11, verse 46, Jesus replied, and you experts in the word of God, that's the law, Woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one little baby finger to help them. They added over 600 additional laws that God had nothing to do with. They seem moral. They even seem core value driven. But I want to ask you a question, even in the church today. What heavy burdens do we place on people that make it difficult for them to enter the true kingdom of God? 
You've got to stop doing these behaviors. And I'm here to say the Apostle Paul said that which I don't want to do, I do. That which I do, I don't want to do. What shall I say, oh, wretched man that I am? It's no longer me that sins, but sin that dwells within me. But if you look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 11, he says, you've got to be in Christ Jesus. You've got, that's the theme of Romans 1 through 11. You've got to be in Christ Jesus. If you want to overcome evil with good, you've got to be in Christ Jesus. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, you'll have no condemnation. If you're in Christ Jesus, you'll change your desires. If you're in Christ Jesus, you'll be justified. If you're in Christ Jesus, you will be an overcomer. He does it over and over and over. The key is that we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. We've got to be in Christ Jesus. Not in a club, not in motivational preaching. But what heavy burdens do we place on people? The religious leaders believe that entering, let me give you a little history here. Here's what the Pharisees believed 2,000 years ago. The religious leaders believed that entering the kingdom of God required, one, you must become a better person. You may not think that happens in our churches today, but we watch 200,000 plus churches that have fallen by the wayside that have had a lot of good ideas and good concepts. And a lot of our preaching is trying to make people become a better person. It's like trying to get a corpse to be more lifelike. But it doesn't make them alive. Number two, following laws that man had failed at since the Garden of Eden. So they gave him about 600 more laws. Number three, they believed in behavior modification, that Gentiles had to modify their eating habits They had to modify their approach towards idolatry. They had to modify cultural idiosyncrasies. They had to work at changing things, but they missed a key point. What about being saved? What about being filled with the Holy Spirit? What about letting the word of Christ dwell in them richly? And then the fourth thing the Pharisees said is if they're truly born again, they must live up to the expectations of the spiritual elite, which were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, spiritual leaders, spiritual leaders. Now, Jesus gave us a very sober warning, uh, saying that we, we better be careful. This warning was to those who were making it difficult for others to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not saying we get people saved and let them keep on sinning. I'm saying when you truly become born again, you will not become reformed. You'll become transformed. So here's the warning. Matthew 23, 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. And he called them actors, pretenders, fakes, hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Guys, we got to look at this. You yourselves do not enter nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Would you imagine this? I don't think we'd ever want to do this. But we have to have an honest talk. We have to be authentic with one another. I have to ask myself, not not about you, I'm talking about just me. I'm trying to imagine slamming the door in the faces of those who earnestly want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Friends, this can happen. I watched it happen in Tacoma under my leadership. I've seen it happen here before. I can see it in my own attitude. Somebody will come in and their behavior is disgusting. Friends, their mindset is disgusting. Their language is disgusting. In fact, you'd almost think they weren't saved. In fact, they weren't. And yet... The only message they need to hear, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You see, once you really get it, not just a prayer, not just a glimpse into eternity, but an authentic encounter with Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes. You see, I'm not here to say, yay, fornication, yay, pornography, yay, drunkenness. No, 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 no. But it's a matter of, do we want to do it like the Mormons, change them from the outside in? Or like the early church, change them from the inside out? 
But here's the stinger of this whole passage that Jesus tells the door slammers, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, by the way, guys, great job. You've kept them out. You're keeping the Gentiles out, the aliens out, the foreigners out, the strangers out, even fellow Jews out of the kingdom. But here's the problem. You yourselves are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine becoming a citizen of God's kingdom is effortless? Let me show you an example of a door slammer. His name was D.L. Moody. He was educated all the way to the ripe old age of fifth grade. This guy was a shoe salesman or shoe cobbler. He dealt with shoes. Later on, he would deal with a different kind of soul, the souls of men. The claim to fame of D.L. Moody is he led more people to Jesus Christ in the 20th century than any person before him until a guy named Mordechai Ham led a young boy named Billy Graham in Sunday school to the Lord who would then lead even more to the Lord. But D.L. Moody did it without television, he did it without radio, he did it without microphones. It was really a phenomenon, if you will. So in Chicago, he joins a Baptist church, and he thinks, i got to join this church. I'm part of the family of God. And yet they had a theological, biblical literacy test, and he failed it three times. He said he can't join. Oh, okay. I always knew I wasn't very smart, but thanks for confirming it. So he'd walk up and down the streets of Madison Avenue in Chicago. Then next to Washington Street, State Street, Wabash Avenue. And wherever Moody would go, he would just tell people that, I met somebody named Jesus. You can enter the kingdom of heaven. You're in the kingdom of darkness. If you want, you can come into the kingdom of light. And people would get saved. And he thought, well, I'm going to bring them to the church that won't let me join. All of a sudden, he had an entire row of what they call followers of Moody. (laughs) And they came to church with him. And they noticed that. And these people didn't seem like the middle-class people that were in the church. Because, you know, I mean, what else did they have to live for except Jesus, right? Now, there was a second row filled with the Moody people. Then a third row. Then events, later on, we find out that um, there were more Moody followers than Baptists that were attending the church. Finally, uh, Moody said, I want to become a member. They said, you can become an auxiliary or a conditional member with an asterisk that says, but you don't know the word of God. And then Moody was told, and you can teach a Sunday school class. They would never let him teach, but you can teach a class, but only to the people that you brought in off the streets. He started teaching them, and they started getting, I I mean, a sense of ministry, and they'd go out, and they'd share, and multiple services, unheard of in those days, were taking place. Eventually, Moody, who led tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of people to Christ, was invited to speak at Oxford University. Oxford University. And the newspapers in Scotland... The Welsh papers, Welsh papers as well as the papers of Great Britain said, Moody is uneducated, he is unqualified, and he butchers the Queen's language, the Queen's English. He still went there to speak. And he said, I've been reading your newspapers, and I'll admit I ain't very good with English. My grammar bad, real bad. He says, but I have a question to ask you. I do butcher the queen's English. But with the limited intellect and limited articulation skills that I have and the limited grasp of grammar, I've led a few hundred thousand people to Jesus. What have you done with your mastery of the queen's English? The commentators say, their very lifestyle and ineffectiveness dammed up like a river in their mouths. You see, friends, becoming a citizen of God's kingdom is effortless. Chuck Smith figured it out when the hippies and the yippies, people who were dressed inappropriately, didn't know what deodorant was, lacked showers, hair down to their waist. I'm talking about the man barefoot in church, sitting in the lotus position in the front of the church. He said, come as you are. 
May I submit to you, Jesus might tell you today to come as you are because who else can you come as? It is understandable how well many people would think we have to clean up our act before we can become eligible for entering the kingdom. Look at Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21. This is where it talks about the fruit of the flesh. We're talking about God's kingdom. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And the church, this, this, these, these acts were mentioned in Romans 1. This was the heathens, the pagan, the unbelievers. And this is where later on Paul will say in Romans 2, 1, Therefore art thou our inexcusable man, wherein you judge another, for when you condemn another, you're judged for the same thing, you know? Because these people are saying, look at the sins of the world. Here they are. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, praise God, we don't do that. Impurity and debauchery, that wasn't the church. Idolatry and witchcraft. And they're going, yeah, yeah, look at what those people do. But when Paul said you're inexcusable because where you judge them, you're being condemned for the same thing, he said, but there's some more acts here you're forgetting about. This is what Romans 1 and 2 is talking about. And he says, but there's also hatred. Have you ever seen hatred among believers or professing but maybe not possessing believers? Hatred just simply means I don't want nothing to do with you. Just disdain disgust. It doesn't mean, I hate you, I wish you were dead. It doesn't mean that. It's not even biblical. Just, I don't even want you. Just flippant. And then it goes on and says, not just hatred, discord, causing division, jealousy. Well, pastor invited them over for dinner. Why didn't he invite me? Pastor noticed them. He didn't notice me. Do we ever have jealousy? Why don't I have a ministry? Because maybe you want a ministry too much. We need Jesus, guys. Discord, jealousy, fits of rage. Remember, our divorce rate in the church is just as high as the world's right now. I'm just throwing these things out for a second. This is what Paul was talking about. Selfish ambition. I'm seeing this among ministers today, friends. Dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness. Oh, good, good. We're back on drunkenness. <laughs> orgies, well, we don't do that, and the like. But you see, we just look at the beginning of the sandwich, the two slices of bread, but we're missing the meat of hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy. Oh, my. And he says here, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, yes, we should have a fear of God. It's the beginning of wisdom. But God's not saying try to fix these things. You can't fix them. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. We need Jesus. It's amazing when you come into the kingdom of heaven. It's amazing when you make the determination, I want this thing done God's way, everything begins to change. See, one could deduce that we have to get it together before we can enter God's kingdom. That's religion. That's what this modern-day behavior modification has done to so many of our churches. i got to get it together. i got to fix myself. I can't come before Jesus until I become a better person. And I'm saying you can't become a better Jesus until Jesus comes inside of you. You see, friends, the whole concept of I have to become better to come before God is a work-based approach to getting into God's kingdom, and it doesn't work. This is a theology that says live by God's standards without God living in you. Can you imagine that? Live by God's standards without God living in you. I'm saying if God's living in you, the life you now live, you'll live by faith in the Son of God. God will live the Christian life in you and through you and for you. It changes everything. John 3, 5 says, oh, Jesus makes it clear that those outside of the kingdom will never stop sinning. Those outside of the kingdom. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, for truly I tell you, no one, we're talking about the kingdom of God, kingdom of God. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born. You know, the water has to break, born of the water and the spirit. 
What did I tell you two weeks ago? The two most important days of your life is the day you are born, born of the water, and born of the Spirit. Born again. The moment we are born again, we are given complete access to the kingdom of God. Complete. But I failed, I screwed up, and I understand. You see, friends, no one, 1 John 3, 9, is born of God. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. But watch this. It doesn't mean, it means a continuous sinning. This is so cool. Because God's DNA, <coughs> God's DNA, his seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning. I mean, there's going to be conviction. When I can gossip and I can lie and I can take advantage of people, cheat on my wife, this is not a personal testimony, by the way. When I can do these things and be okay with that? Friends, we've bought into another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. The Bible says the truth is not in me and I'm a liar. Here's the great news. We just want God's seed in us. And says God's seed remains in them, they cannot go on sinning. Why? Because they've been born from above. They've been born of God. <coughs> it changes everything. It changes everything. We teach people that sin is what keeps them out of the kingdom. Not true. Sin is not what keeps you out of the kingdom. Not being born again is what keeps us out of the kingdom. When I'm born from above, when I'm born of God, friends, to tell a person, stop sinning, stop doing that, you know better. If they're not born from above, it's ridiculous. The things of the Spirit are foolishness to those who perish. The things of the Spirit can be only spiritually discerned. The fleshly, the sinful mind cannot discern the things of the Spirit. See, when the seed of God is inside of us, the king is calling the shots from within. How many of you know that's true? He's calling the shots. <laughs> when, 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 when you and I decide I'm going to just change myself and apply pressure from the outside, you could have done that as a Mormon, a Jehovah Witness. Here it is, the big A, the big A word, even an atheist. See, Paul reminds us how our life changes when Christ lives inside of us. Watch this. The Jews had God outside of them for a long time. And they kept on going into exile, and they kept sinning and failing. This is the difference between the new covenant. In the old covenant, Emmanuel, God outside of us, God among us, God near us, God with us. In the new covenant, it's Theos, God in us. Look at Colossians 2, verse 8 through 11. See to it that no one takes you captive or places you in bondage through hollow and deceptive love of knowledge. That's what philosophy is. Philo, love of knowledge, which it says here, see to it that no one <laughs> takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on, it rests on, it's built on, it's invested in human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So we end up with a love of knowledge and actually demonic powers, things that come from rulers in high places, rulers of darkness, for in Christ, it all changes when you're in Christ. That's Romans 1 through 11, in Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead, the deity lives in bodily form. It's in you. It's in me. All of it. And in Christ, when you're in Christ, <coughs> you've been brought to fullness. Are we really in Christ? He is the head over every power and authority. We're so busy trying to deal with the demonic forces and generational curses. He's the head over every power. You're so worried about who the president is? He is the power, he's the ruler over every power and every authority. In him, Christ, you were also circumcised. What kind of circumcision? With a circumcision, the heart, not performed by human hands. God did it. God did it. Your whole self ruled by the flesh. Fruit of the flesh, not the fruit of the spirit. 
Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off like a cheap suit. It was put it away, Paul says. Put it away. Throw it away. Put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Friends, I've worked with so many different programs, and you can get as mad at me as you want. We can have support groups for everything. I think in our churches we need a support group to get people delivered from support groups. If you've gone through Celebrate Recovery three times, four times, five times, that becomes your group and you have to constantly go through it. Friends, let me help you out. That's no different than Alcoholics Anonymous then. There comes a point that whatever group we have, and I'm not against support groups, I'm not against Celebrate Recovery, but there comes a point you've got to be offloaded from the group. The group is always an invitation to get born again. It's always an invitation to get in Christ. In Christ Jesus, you'll get rid of the condemnation. In Christ Jesus, you'll be justified. In Christ Jesus, you'll be more than a conqueror. In Christ Jesus, you can do all things. But it's getting people in. Not a religion. Not a program, but Christ Jesus. See, once you enter the kingdom of God, the fullness of the Godhead and his power is in you. See, Christ is the one who does the work of putting off the body of sin. So here's a few things I want you to take home with you today. I wonder if a message like this is just too foreign, too weird. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. How many of you know this is basic, rudimentary Christianity 101? It doesn't have three cute little points. I don't have a real illustration for you today. I talked about Monaco and my wife, but I really don't have one. So what does it take to enter the kingdom of God? How many of you agree we want to enter the kingdom of God. We're not born again if we don't. So that's important. And if we're not staying in the kingdom of God, we've got to ask, are we in Christ? Well, it's real simple. This is going to be so simple, you're going to go, whoa. I could have stayed home. Number one, bow down to the king. We sing all, hail King Jesus, bow down to the king. We have done a great job the last 50 years helping people meet Jesus as what? Savior. We've done a horrible job as leaders, calling them to be accountable to his lordship. If you're really in Christ, friends, I mean, I'm not tearing people sh- uh, shreds for a divorce, man, because let me be real forthright. you got a whole bunch of people that stay married in the church that hate their spouse. <laughs> Is that any better? If we're in Christ and we can't work out a marriage, don't be condemned. Don't get mad at me. Just get in Christ. If you're really in Christ, you don't think he's going to control your tongue, your appetites? When you have the fruit of the Spirit and you're in Christ, the fruit of the flesh doesn't have a chance. You bow down to the king. Number two, can I give you a great piece of advice? Avoid man's religious methods. Anything that I tell you to do, anything I encourage you to do that is not in Christ Jesus, discard it. If I keep telling you, discard me. Here's the reality, friends. If we're in Christ, we do not need man's religious methods. Can I blow your mind? Jesus is more than enough. More than enough. And number three, let God transform you, not a preacher. Let God transform you, not your husband, not your wife. Listen to them. Be sensitive. Be loving, be kind, be gracious. Walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Walk in love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and meekness and temperance and faith. Or oh my, (laughs) you know it's important. But friends, what would happen today if we would just say, Lord, I want to be in Christ. I want you to be in me. You in Christ, the Bible says, Christ in you. That is the hope of God glory. Let God transform you. See, friends, there's a lot of people that they're trying to do this in their own strength. How many of you ever met people? How many of you have ever been guilty like me? You try to become a better person, a disciplined person. Friends, Marge will tell you, when I make a decision to fast, I don't care if I'm hungry or not. I I can go weeks. I'm not going to eat. I have that nature. I think they call that compulsive behavioral disorder or something like that. If I make a decision, I made a decision, I remember right where I was at. 
uh, 39, yeah, 39 years ago that I would read the Bible through every three months. And I've never stopped. I just made a decision. It was important to me. But that has nothing to do with being in Christ. That's just part of my nature. But you see, there's people so trying to get it right with God from the outside in, they still crucify themselves today. Have you ever seen these Christians in the Philippines? I mean, give me that picture if you would, please. Uh, yeah, look at this, man. Rob, I was thinking for next uh, Resurrection Sunday, maybe you'd be willing to volunteer. These guys have nails in their hands, and I mean, they bring them right to the point of death, and they reenact the whole story, and they feel this makes them more spiritual. This came from Catholicism. The Catholics technically renounce it right now, but they still do it all over the world. Did you know there's people who still beat themselves with chains and whips? I mean, it's nuts. They're bleeding. And they just believe by that this way they feel they're, I, this is how they think they get in Christ. Like, let me go through what Jesus went through. How many of you agree? Bad plan? That's not how you get in Christ, okay? You see, it says in Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not human performance. It's not keeping the kosher laws or anything else, but of righteousness. Be in Christ, you'll be righteous. If you want to get peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, you got to get in the Holy Spirit. you got to get in Christ. So here's a few kingdom considerations you're going home with. You ready for this now? They're so simple, they're almost embarrassing. Spend time with the king. If you want to be in Christ, spend time with the king. Can I really freak you out for a second? Because I probably already have. If you have no appetite for God's word, you don't have to read the word to be saved. It's just that if you're saved, you'll read the Word. You'll have an appetite. When Marge would write me love letters, oh, I got you, babe. Come on. I read every one of them. Trisha, I still have every one of them. They're none of your business. But I still have them. Long before Trisha, there were love letters from Bill to Marge. You'll never know how much I care. And you know what? They were meaningful. Because they came from Marge. They came from my wife. Those are letters that still give me great pleasure and joy. So that's going to be something that begins to change. So here it is. Spend time with the king. Number two, what areas do you have to stop trying to do what only God can do? <laughs> when I first went into the ministry, I had friends whose wives could play the piano. Maddie, they could play the piano. That's real big time, you know, in Bible college. You know, you got to marry a woman who can play the piano. You have to do that, man, for sure. Marge can definitely play dun, 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 dun. But how many worship courses can I write to chopsticks? You know what I mean? It just doesn't work. And then I had friends whose wives would get up and they'd begin to preach, man. <laughs> oh, I want to say, thank you, Lord. I'm in Christ. I'm going to be quiet. And one day... Um, I said, Marge, here's some things I'd like you to consider that would really help the ministry. And she looked at me and said, you married well, sweetheart. And if you want to keep it well, stop trying to do God's job in my life. Read the word to me. Let's get into the word together. Let's pray together. I'll do awesome with preschoolers. I'll do awesome with people. I'll do awesome with counseling. But you're not going to make me something that God didn't design me to be. I can't tell you how grateful I am today for that discussion I was very ungrateful for at the time. Stop trying to change other people. How many of you here really believe God answers prayer? Can I give you a word? I'm giving this to some people in the church here. And this is something I wrote months ago. I, I, I put this series together. I knew what the theme was going to be. This is about 11 months ago. So it's got nothing to do with anything that's happening today. Here's what it is. If there's times that any of you disappoint me or frustrate me, I don't go to you. I don't even go to my wife with it. I don't go to my daughter, Tricia. I get on my knees because I'm there every day. And I go to God. I go to God. I'd like to encourage you I live in a world, friends, where people at times are very disenchanted and discontented. 
And there's times I will disappoint you. Guaranteed. And I know this because there were so many of you that were so disappointed in life long before you even knew that there was a Bill Wolfson. Get on your knees. Pray. Lord, change him. Or Lord, change me. Or Lord, send him somewhere else. Or Lord, send me somewhere else. But go to God. So often, we are motivated by the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of our life, and we think we know how this whole thing should work. So often we're so weak, except, you know, if my wife would be like this, if my husband would be like that, if my child, if my parent, if my boss, wait, 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 wait. Get on your knees. And don't tell God what to do. Lord, I'm frustrated. Please work this thing out. How many of you here believe God answers prayer? How many think prayer works better than gossip and complaining and grumbling and murmuring? And I'm just calling you to it, friends, because kind of creating a new tenor, because I've watched a church explode a thousand miles away. Explode. Explode. And I've made a decision when people are carnal, just because they feel that they have a right, because they're Americans, you know, (laughs) <laughs> to grumble and complain? Mm-mm. I have a garden. You've heard this before. I have a garden. And in my garden, there's beautiful flowers. And I love avocados, by the way. Love avocados. There's avocados in there. I also enjoy pomegranates. Except when they get caught between my dental. Oh, that's another story. But, you know, I, I like pomegranates. Angel, I love pomegranates. But you know, there's times people want to come into my garden and they want to dump their frustrations and their hurt. So I'm putting a sign outside my garden that says, no dumping allowed. When there's things that can be done better, man, I'm always open. But there comes a point where you have to stop and say in your life, do you really think you're going to change me or I'm going to change you or you're going to change everyone around you? After you take about 64 trips around the sun, kind of what you see is what you get. Now, if you see a character issue in me, Come talk to me. If you see me deliberately trying to hurt you, or even undeliver- not, uh, even if it's not deliberate, I want to know. If you see me sinning with my mouth against you, I want to know. Now, character is, ne- when you start violating biblical principles and character, that's without excuse. You come to me. But friends, stop trying to change what only God can change. How many of you have anyone in your life I'm just being upfront with you. How many of you have been able to change somebody permanently with complaining? Grumbling. Self-pity. I'm talking about in your life. And then finally, receive the Holy Ghost. I'm going to say something very hard right now, and many of you watching as well. It's really easy. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today. I pray with my understanding, and I pray in the Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today, and this church for a long time has dishonored the Holy Spirit. And that's back to our founding. How many of you believe the Holy Spirit is for today? I I need to know, man. Maybe some of you are looking shocked. And it's something that should have been ministered. But you see, when you're living in sin, the last thing I'd want to do as a pastor is bring you into the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the prophetic will happen then. Words of wisdom will happen then. Words of knowledge will happen now. you got to hear, we're so afraid to speak the truth, but here's what it is. I judge nobody else, but I'm telling you right now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, friends, has taken a backseat throughout America now for quite a few years. We need it. And here's the other part, and it's not about tongues. Yes, I do speak in tongues, but that's not the point. That's not what it's about. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be so quickly convicted of your sin. So will I. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will come into praise and worship with reckless abandon, friends. Reckless love. I mean, it'll change everything when you're really filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll know that your knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, well, knowledge and understanding especially, is what a blip on the radar screen. We need Jesus. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, friends, You'll begin to walk in authentic love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. And all you have to do is say, ask. 
Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. If you're at home right now, two things I'd like you to do. If you have prayed the sinner's prayer before, but you're finding you never get traction, today, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. This is for real now. And ask him to do what we just read today. Circumcise my heart. Give me a new heart, Lord. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. You're risen from the dead. Tell him that. And I choose to not just accept you as Savior, but Lord. And our takeaway here, would you join me just saying, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Friends, it'll change everything. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. You'll have a love for the Word. Fill me with your Spirit. You'll get an appetite for the Word like you've never had. Fill me with your Spirit. You will give grace to people that are failing and screwing up. You'll be blown away. Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And then when you come and you find that person, because you have the Holy Spirit, if you find a person caught up in a fall, you who are spiritual will restore them with a spirit. Spirit of meekness. What do you think that spirit of meekness is? Your meekness? No. The Holy Spirit. And if you don't do it that way, we, when we do it in our own strength, we get caught up in that same fault. So I encourage you. Friends, no condemnation. Just get in Christ. Grab hold of this word. I hope you receive this word. I believe you receive this word. Because today, I promise you, this is the word of the Lord. God's favor is on you.